So if you want to read my column weekly, one place to get it is, of course, The Gazette. My boss at The Gazette, Wayne Logason, editor of the editorial section. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing fine. How's We paper? need to have a serious talk after this <laughs> show. Yeah. <laughs> Got some discipline? Meet me in my office. Come to my office. Yes. <clears throat> I'm sorry I disappointed you. How's the Gazette doing? I mean, all, doing... Pa all papers are, are <clears throat> taking it on the chin during yeah. this recession. You can't be, a, uh, but that's not your problem. How's circulation? Well, circulation's great. Uh, COVID-19. Is that just something that every, every editor has to say? No, it honestly, COVID-19 has helped our circulation numbers tremendously. People are... They, you know, people were sitting at home. They wanted to be informed. They wanted to know what was going on. So our, particularly our digital subscriptions, saw a very sharp increase, which was very welcome to see that because our advertising went the other direction. Obviously, uh, people, grocery stores were trying to keep stuff on the shelves. So you're, <clears throat> you lost a lot of the big supermarket <laughs> ads. Supermarkets didn't uh, need to advertise. Nobody was much in the car buying business during COVID-19. So you lost that. You lost real estate ads because it was hard to show homes. And those are the big three, really, for any newspaper. So when did the Gazette, by the way, when did the Gazette turn to become the Gazette? I grew up, it was the Colorado Springs Gazette. Now it's just the Gazette. The Gazette. I don't know. I can't tell you when they took that because it's been that way since I've been there, since they took Colorado Springs out of the official yeah. name of the Gazette. Um, Still very much a Colorado Springs paper, but it's not limited to Colorado Springs. Which, by many by many metrics, we're the largest newspaper in the state, depending on what what date what you look at. As far as page really? count, we certainly are. Uh, circulation what do you mean wise, page we're, count. What is that? Is the the amount of content, the number of pages in each in each edition. So in other words, you've got a thicker paper than the we, have, we have a thicker paper than anyone else in the state, right. and uh, our staff is robust and growing. Um, we've added a lot of investigative reporters, people on the ground here in Denver. And um, so we're... What, we're, what's, we're, a we're what's the relationship between the Gazette and Colorado politics? Because I know your sister publications. Right. It's the same relationship as you would have between, say, the Gazette and the Washington Examiner. Clarity Media Group, which is a Colorado-based company based here in Denver, uh, owns Colorado politics, and they procured the Statesman which had been around for a long time, uh, and, and, and brought it into the Colorado politics brand. So that goes out as a print edition. Got it. And um, they own the Washington Examiner, they own the Gazette, and this is uh, a local Colorado family. It comes under the auspices of a local, of a Colorado business family that most of us know, uh, the Anschutz family. And they just care tremendously about this state and realize that the media and the country and realize that the fourth estate, the media, is a real important part of society. Right. Let's get to the fourth estate and the riots. Yes. All right, so um, where we're located as we're, as we're taping this, we're in the center of those riots. They've calmed down. Hopefully, as this airs, uh, they'll stay calm. But <clears throat> the, the destruction around our offices is remarkable. Right. I've never seen anything like it. I walked around yesterday on Colfax Avenue. My eyes started to burn from residue left over from from tear gas it, it was really amazing and the question was why was the media what did the media help or hurt because i'm there watching it every station had a reporter there reporting every frisbee that was thrown yeah. uh it really seemed to fan the flames of it and what i didn't understand was so many of these stations were the ones who were saying that social distancing was going to save us but it didn't seem so <laughs> care so Not much about that. now, is it? Yeah. yeah. And so if in two weeks we don't have massive COVID cases coming out through Colorado, I'm going to really wonder about the uh, social distancing. Well, that will answer some of those questions because we social distancing and, and that is out the window now, and now you have the kind of crowds that you would have for a sporting event. And you asked, does the media change the event itself? It's impossible that it does not. If anyone who's familiar with the Heisenberg effect, simply looking at anything, right. you or I looking at anything changes it. Um, when you show up with TV cameras at a riot, you become the central cause of the rioters because they, their whole, they're trying to make a point. They want to be seen by the masses, not by other rioters, by the masses. And so I've, you know, I remember, um, 
the the Missouri riots. Uh, what was the town? Um, in Missouri, right, anyway, after yeah. the shooting. Um, there were times when a Fox News camera was out there, and the producer realized, you know, this is still going on only because we're here, and we're going to close down now. And wow. I remember seeing that, and I thought, yeah, the, 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 this is going to perpetuate until the cameras are gone. So the TV stations in Denver share uh, have shared cameras, so they have a shared copter. It used to be that every station had their own helicopter. Right. No, no, one helicopter, everybody chips in, and they get the same feed. And it was on, like, like 24-7, just as a monitor, and, you know, they'd, they'd fly and follow anything, and you're stuck at home, and so why not? Why not watch this? Well, it's it is int it's fun to watch. I mean, not fun to watch. It's I know it, it's exactly it's certainly what you it's mean. like you, it's like driving by a train wreck. You're going to look, and so and I don't blame the media. The media need to be there. The media need to cover this. We need to know what's going on. But it so it's not the media's fault. But it is inevitable that they perpetuate this it. movement, which was ignited by a police killing. A, from my point of view, a very very wrongful police killing. Uh, that being said, I can't imagine this guy's going to get a fair trial anywhere. No, no um, way. Uh, but that was hijacked very quickly by, I don't know, what do we call them Antifa? Do we call them anarchists? Do we, what, I don't know what we call them, but I know that this is, this is being used to, to, to push a political agenda far outside of police brutality. Oh, absolutely. And I think that just general purpose anarchists would be who they are. Some of them may affiliate with Antifa, whatever that really is. Some of really them just is. wanted a good time. They, Some, you know, they were overwhelmingly white guys who wanted to to go out and cause some trouble. And they showed up with a case of beer or a bottle of whiskey uh, to watch something burn as if it's a bonfire to celebrate some sort of an event and are looting stores, going in, walking out with giant uh, flat screen televisions and and everything else they can grab in the store. Those people don't give a damn about George Floyd. That is not, George Floyd is the farthest thing from their minds. Now that is certainly not the majority of people who rightly, we should, you know, there would be a problem in this country if we didn't have peaceful protests in reaction to what we all saw happen to George Floyd. That was a murder for all to see. And a, and a gruesome one, really, when you think about what it would be like to die that way. Uh, this is the stuff of, that gives people nightmares. And so there would be something wrong if we weren't staging protests. But the protests are not the looting and the violence and the arson. Did the police respond appropriately? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no. And here's, here's why. That in order to, to look like they're, they're not part of the problem. They kept a very soft approach until, <clears throat> until um, they were attacked by bottles or rocks or any of these things, then the tear gas flew. But they were right there while people were vandalizing and spray painting buildings. And right. every one of those people should have been arrested and prosecuted and taken off the streets. But my sense is the cops felt a catch-22, which was, they want us to arrest them so that they can scream police brutality. Um, my feeling is that could well be. I don't care. Do I your damn care. job That's, and arrest them. It's not their job to worry about the perceptions of people whom they arrest. Right. Now, we have a right to peaceably assemble in this country, which a lot of people have done in response to this. We also have a right to our property and to our lives and to be in, in a reasonable expectation of safety, public safety that we pay for. And so George Floyd dies a gruesome death, and as a result of that, uh, we see a complete victimization of largely minority communities. You know, we heard How some- How do you mean that? Well, this happens every time there's anything like a race riot in this country. It is the very people that the rioters would tell you that who they care about the minorities who are abused by police. They're the ones who, it's, it, is, it is that demographic that loses businesses, that, that has their businesses burned to the ground. It, it was heart-wrenching to see the firefighter in Minneapolis who had just put his life savings into a, a new business that was right. going to open as soon as the COVID-19 thing settled down, which was you know, this week he was going to open. It wasn't insured. They burned it to the ground. They ruined his life. 
we know George from what we've heard from George Floyd's family. That is not what they're about. That is the last thing they would want to see. We heard some talk about protesters, Antifa. There was some sort of fake news release that they were going to take this to the suburbs. That's not probably not a good idea for them because I don't think they I, I don't think they'd get the same passive reaction in the suburbs. <laughs> also, but it's, people in the suburbs, we got guns, right? And we're not we're, you go ahead and try to loo loot our house and see what happens. That was a planted story. It looks like from um, um, from a from a neo Nazi type organization, but right. But, but if they but were the smart, point, that and they really cared. If they were, I'm not advocating anyone do this. I'm saying if they were smart and they really cared about the minority community, that's exactly what <laughs> they, they would do. They would avoid destroying minority communities where these offenses take place, where you know where 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 someone is abused by police. They would avoid destroying that community and they go into some other community to make their point. They just further victimize the very people who they're, who they supposedly care so much about. The um, I'm not too sure what the solution is. I've got two ideas. One is put forward by a civil rights lawyer here in town, David Lane, who's advocated to me and actually wrote something in the Post saying the problem is the protections for cops need to end. That if you go after a cop civ uh, civilly the city still pays the damage. Congratulations, the family just won a million dollar suit, but the taxpayers paid. If he had to pay a portion of that, if he was there, uh, he'd, he, he wouldn't act that way. The other reform that I support, though, is that I think our chiefs of police should be elected, not um, appointed. I very rarely see this happen in a sheriff's office. Right. I very rarely see deputies who work for elected sheriffs uh, treating voters for their boss that badly. No, exactly. You can definitely, you can, in Colorado, it's the, the, the distinction between a sheriff's department and a police department is very real. The positions that sheriffs take on, say, Second Amendment issues versus what a police chief position is, it, 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 it's, it's a stark contrast. Um, the other one I'm, I'm not convinced on, which is take away the immunity from police officers. I don't know what we do there, with cops. There's with a cops. problem with that. Uh, I, 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 I've heard a lot of that, too, that there is too much protection. On the other hand, police officers will tell you it's getting harder and harder to recruit new police officers. It's too dangerous, or it's perceived to be too dangerous. And if your employer, if the community won't back you up when you have to make a hard decision. Now, this, what we saw in Minneapolis, was it, it's unexplainable. It makes no sense that anyone would do that. On the other hand, we've seen a lot of shootings. There was a very controversial shooting in Colorado Springs last summer. Davon Bailey, teenager, uh, ran from cops. They shot him seven or eight times in the back. It's all on video. Um, well, it was a split-second decision. They, he had a gun. Uh, he was running toward a park. Uh, there were lots of reasons why they did what they did, but it was still highly controversial. Um, those officers were vindicated, and they need. And, and sometimes officers do things that look terrible. Right. But and so anyway, I, we, we, I, it's a, it's, a, it's it gets into it. We're not going to have law enforcement if we don't support them. But what would it, if if there wasn't police unions? What might that look like? That would be a you whole know, different scenario. There would be a whole different yeah. scenario. And so I think it's a worthwhile thing to argue, which is when you have that, when you have that security and you know you're not going to lose your house, that's a different thing. You right. Know, um, and look teachers, at this cop had 18, 18 major serious complaints against him about abusive language, abusive behavior, and he was still working. Yeah, the, um, um, you know, teachers, depending on the district, don't get that type of immunity. But still, they're in danger, and there are all sorts of accusations against teachers. Right. And a lot of them say, that's why I got to join the union for the, for the insurance money, yeah. um, for the liability insurance. What other policies would you change? I, I, it's nice to say, well, we all need to understand. Um, I'm, I'm tired of f 55 years of being called a racist be, because I'm a, I'm a fiscal conservative, and I don't believe in the welfare state. Right. Um, yeah, so what, what do we do? 
in, in terms of policing, I don't know what we do. I do like the idea of electing police chiefs, making them directly accountable to the public. It changes everything. Um, I don't know, uh, unionization is a huge problem because the union just blindly uh, supports members. They don't ask the question. That's what they get paid to do. That's, if you're a union member, you're paying for that. So that's something we need to look at. And I think we need to uh, somehow, th why did three cops stand there and watch this happen and do nothing? Because they were afraid of what would happen to them among their peers if they interrupted. I, I believe that is the case. Heather McDonald, I think with the Manhattan Institute, has yeah. done a lot of the research showing there's the other side of this, which is more and more cops are hesitating in pulling the trigger or using force with a black uh, suspect for fear of something like this happening. And she's been tracking the number of cops that have been hurt because they are hesitating when it comes, comes to this. Right. So, you know, this is, this is getting bad on both sides. Let, let, let's wrap it up this way. I, I want to take these ridiculous riots um, and COVID and our response. I think they are so related. One, that you've got angry people who have been cooped up for a ridiculous amount of time for, uh, for, for two months. You have minorities, especially, who were, for the first time in a decade, making higher wages at a faster rate right. than... than rich guys were. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about this, no. but throughout the whole malaise of the Obama years, um, African Americans had their lowest unemployment uh, re uh, until COVID. Right. Hispanics, the same thing. People in the lower income brackets were making raises, getting more wealthy, making more money than the rich guys. It was humiliating to the left. They have promised those types of outcomes for minority communities for decades and not gotten them. And then their worst nightmare occurs, the election of Donald Trump. And suddenly great things are happening for minority communities. Employment, uh, record high employment, record low unemployment, rising wages. Yeah, it, it was a crisis for the left. It's almost as if we need to manufacture something to destroy the economy to endanger this man's reelection. What do we do? You've, pardon me for getting conspiratorial, you have Dr. Fauci who in what February said, don't wear a mask, don't wear a mask. everything's fine, and then close down everything. Um, we you, don't have, he, he said, we have very little to worry about in the United States. Late in February, into March, Redfield, with the CDC was saying the same thing. Um, everyone, the, the Surgeon General of the United States, Redfield, Fauci, all of them were saying, don't wear a mask, don't look like a drama queen. We don't. Then all of that changed. <clears throat> now, I don't have a, I'm not one of these conspiracy theorists who says, oh, somebody caused this disease right. so that they could create mayhem. No, but the way that the disease was managed definitely changed overnight. We were going to avoid fear and panic and looking dramatic by wearing a mask. We were going to avoid all of that. We were going to underplay the potential harm of this so that life could go on. And then something changed. And it's not that masks changed. It's not that the dynamics of the way a virus spreads changed. One guy gets off a boat or a plane, you know what, how a virus works. Right. Get two or three others and then two, the, the, the math is obvious to most people. Um, we see it with computer viruses. Okay, so none of that changed. What changed was our approach to it very quickly changed. And the media uh, narrative now is that the doctors had this right all along and the politicians, Trump mainly, just simply didn't listen to men of science. No, the men of science got this very wrong. Whether they believed it or not, they had one agenda and now they have a different agenda. It was flatten the curve, now it's saved every life no matter what at every cost. Right. You know, so what we're doing is we're taking our most vulnerable people who are elderly, uh, forcing COVID patients into nursing homes. Um, at the same time, we've robbed kids of their educations. Mm -hmm. We've destroyed America's economy. We've got 30% unemployment. Uh, we've increased the already outrageous debt that we had placed on younger generations. I, I insist that has something to do with the mindset of some 
you know, aside from the fact some of these people are just crazy. But if you're going out and you're destroying things, you're taking bats to windows and lighting things on fire, you don't give a shit about the future. Right. Pardon my language. You don't care about the future. You don't believe in it. And uh, so you're willing to destroy things. And I think when you put people in the kind of debt that w that older generations have put on these people, and now you're adding to it, adding to it, yeah. adding to it overnight. Including Republicans. Creates who, hopelessness. Who, who bid on all this fear and gave an incentive for people not to go back to work. People I know in the restaurant industry um, are making more money on unemployment than they made working. It would be idiotic is, to go back to work. <clears throat> if you're making more money <clears throat> to stay home and not work, and you have children to feed, you have obligations, it would be wrong to go back to work. I am disappointed in our team. I expected from there. I expected the media to fan the flames of fear because it's ratings and they felt so damn self-important. You could yeah. see it in their eyes as they reported. They're saving lives, they're reporting from home. Uh, really what they're doing is going to be one of, I think history will show this as one of the biggest overreactions, most dangerous, um, painful, financial, destructive responses we've ever had. Right. And uh, I, I, it could take decades to undo the damage, not of COVID, but of this reaction to COVID. Yeah. Uh, and I know, and do, do the surveys. I'm in the minority of opinions on that one. Well, I'm, I'm with you. And I think um, economically, this is going to be a long-term crisis because, you, look, you and I are for tax cuts. We're for giving, you know, taking money out of government and giving it to the people. And I think a lot of people on the right side of the aisle see the checks in the mail. They view it that way. You have to think about the printing press. Okay, this money isn't real. It's being created. And it's going into an economy that, is, that, that, that was shut down to produce less. There's nothing to do with the money. There's very little to do with the money. That's a classic setup for a, a massive inflation, currency inflation problem uh, because you've got too much, too much currency chasing too few goods and services and commodities. And that's what I'm afraid we're going to start seeing is runaway inflation. We're going to find out. And then whatever, whatever financial assets you have, whatever cash assets you have just simply become worth less People, and less. I mean, you and I are the age we remember uh, stagnation. We remember high unemployment and high inflation. Mind you, it was dad's problem. It wasn't my problem. Right. But pretty soon it's going to be our problem. I worry about that. Hey, got to run. Wayne, thank you. Pick up the Gazette. Go to gazette.com. Thanks, John. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button, too. You don't want to miss a single show.